but we are also a family of 255,000 pilots, builders, and dreamers who support one another and share the spirit of aviation year-round. This week, we invite you to see what we are about. At EAA, we educate and inspire each other 12 months a year through a huge collection of original content, including EAA Sport Aviation Magazine, videos and webinars, blogs and podcasts, social media, and forums. If you're looking for friends who share your passion, look no further than local chapters. Connect with others through social and educational events, aircraft building and restoration, and your journey to becoming a pilot, including all the resources you need. As a member, you'll enjoy free access to more than 400 museums around the world, including our aviation museum right here in Oshkosh. Plus, you'll save on hotel and car rentals, aircraft financing and insurance, and purchases from Ford, John Deere, and more. Through it all, we work tirelessly to protect our members' rights. As your advocate, we make sure your voice is heard on issues like medical and flight test reform and other general aviation concerns. We hope you will consider joining us today. Visit eaa.org slash join EAA together for an exclusive offer available to new members during Spirit of Aviation Week. My name is Bob DeFord. I'm from Prescott, Arizona, and I brought a home-built, full-scale Mark 9 Spitfire. You know, a real one now is two million bucks, and I don't want a real one. And I thought, I'm going to build one. I've done, uh, you know, mechanicing and stuff all my life. I love to do it. But to build a Spitfire, I found a guy that can do anything, and we built it. And we didn't know if we could, you know, we had the plans, and. Let's go, you know, and we just started and we'd stand back. We didn't never consult with the computer. We went, burn, that looks good. I'm always impressed when people have ideas and they do something. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely stunning. It's a real airplane. It's got pistons. It makes noise. It probably leaks a little oil. It's fast. It looks cool. I like it. So you got a wooden wing, a wooden tail, and a tubular fuselage with metal skin. Very, very simple, simple to build. I mean, you know, not, I didn't know anything about wood and now I'm an expert. I still don't know anything about it. And firewall forward was up to us. This engine and mount has a thin piece of car tire rubber separating the engine from the mount, just so it doesn't chafen. So the engine is bolted to this airplane. When it idles about 500 RPM, it rocks the wings like, I mean, three, two feet either way. And because there is no shock absorbers where most engines have engine rubbers and things like that. So that's very cool when I love to pull it back and let it rock because it's just a monster. It's like, let me add it. You know? I wanted an Allison engine because it, for one thing, all my wrenches fit it. Uh, it's an American engine and I bought them pretty cheap from a guy in Kansas that had a whole bunch of them. And he sold me, a, he gave me a heck of a deal. And then later on he says, I sold those to you too cheap. And I said, I know you did, and I'm not giving you any more. But I couldn't find a Curtis Electric. All Allison's had Curtis Electrics, P38s, P40s. Expensive, out of, you know, $100,000, $200,000. So a DC3 prop, perfect. I bought it brand new in a box for $3,000. Paid 3,500 to have it overhauled. The only thing about this, it's so big, that in level flight, there's two inches of clearance before it hits the ground. So my Allison guy says, oh, you gotta cut that prop off before you're gonna get it. Well, it's one of 330 hours I haven't got it yet. And I'm not gonna get it. It's a, a one piece, 36 foot, 10 inch wing. One piece. And you laminate these bar planks. They're three quarters of an inch thick, uh, six inches wide. Douglas fir, the most beautiful stuff you ever saw. I was two or three years old in my sandbox in Bakersfield and four P-38s pitched over my house right on the deck and scared the heck out of me, but it just, in my heart. So I've always wanted to do this. This is the only thing I ever want to do is fly World War II stuff. When you get in this thing and it starts going, 
when you look over the side and the ground is going by fast, you think, I'm, I'm in a machine here. I'm, and we put these guns on about three months ago, and just to look out at those guns, I'm just going, you, you just kind of, I'm overwhelmed. You look at this big elliptical wing when you're flying, you just lay it up on a wing, and I mean, it's just such a dream to fly, and you drop the nose down, and it just starts picking up speed, and you know, you're up to 300 miles an hour before you know it, and you go, oh my God. And then in a loop, it just goes over, and as you come out the bottom, you go boom, and you hit the wake, which is kind of a perfect loop, and it does, just a nice round loop. I noticed one time looking at pictures of Spitfires or cruising along and it always like they're always like this. I don't know why, but they're just up a little. You can see the difference, the deflection. Well I'm flying along and I'm looking out my Malcolm Hood and I go, oh my god, it's just it looks exactly like that. And I go, I did it. You know, it was fun. To sit in it is like a time warp. It's looking through the gun side, you've got the top right there and just amazing. Building an airplane is not easy and so to take a World War II aircraft fighter and say you know I'm gonna put this one together and I mean these parts don't exist anymore no one's making them so you're doing it all from scratch I think that's probably the most amazing piece aside from the elliptical wing. Vern and I are having coffee in Sisters Oregon and we're I'm saying Vern we gotta have a rear rear mirror all Spitfires have rear rear mirrors and we're going, oh, here we were, and you, you could buy one for 300 bucks, 400 bucks. So we're walking down the street and we walk by this kitchen implement shop, and there's all these ladles and stuff hanging in there, and we go in there, and Vern looks around and says, get that. So we take this thing off the wall, it's got a light, you know, a handle on it and everything, and we're holding it, looking, going, it. Now we gotta go to Napa and find a mirror that will fit in it. So we go to Napa, we find this mirror, it just falls in like it was built for it. He says, let's go. We go back to the shop, cuts the handle off, builds this little stanchion. We screw the mirror in. That's it, 12 bucks. And I love it. It's round, it's perfect. I've never seen any Falk Wolfs in it, but I'm looking. I'm not a millionaire, I, I, but I got enough. I got enough to do it. And most people do it, you know, when you're retired and when you're, you know, you're in your uh, older years, you can do something like this. And all you got to do is want it. I mean, I couldn't wait. And I thought, when I'm done with my home build, it's going to be exactly what I want. This is what the EA is all about. Every day during AirVenture, there's something new to see. It's the first time at Oshkosh for the newly restored B-29 Superfortress Dock. Well, we brought Dock into Oshkosh for the first time. It was a spectacular, you know. It's been a goal of the organization, uh, Dock's friends, for years. And uh, last year we flew right before Oshkosh. They just couldn't get the testing and everything done. And, but after that, the whole goal has been to uh, be at Oshkosh 2017. It's about the history, it's about the men who flew them, the women who built them. Honor those who, uh, who flew them, educate the, the next generation, and, uh, and just generally have the airplane before display. Another special first-timer at AirVenture arrived midweek and had a chance to dominate the blue Wisconsin skies. <music> Aviation City's inhabitants came alive for one of the world's premier jet demonstration teams, the U.S. Navy's Blue Angels. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Your United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron takes pleasure in performing for you this, our 36th flight demonstration of the 2017 season. I'm Lieutenant Brandon Hippler, the narrator for the Blue Angels. From the right, the Blue Angel Diamond.
Approaching center point on Commander Bernanke's command, all four pilots will simultaneously roll their aircraft 360 degrees. From the right, at 365 miles per hour, the Blue Angel Echelon Parade. The opposing horizontal rolls. The Blue Angel Vertical Break. Ladies and gentlemen, the Section High Alpha Pass. It's Steph Strickland here with another EAA Spirit of Aviation Week segment. And I want to introduce you to a man who is a good friend and a phenomenal pilot who has done a lot of cool things in his life. Joining us now, Aaron Fitzgerald. Hey, Aaron, how are you doing? Hi, Steph. How are you doing today? Where are you joining us from? I am in Shreveport, Louisiana in Kevin Coleman's hangar. So I'm at the Tubro Aviation Facility and I'm lucky to be here. It's an amazing place and we're getting to do a lot of really fun stuff. Now, I know that you live on the West Coast. What is it that brings you out to Kevin Coleman's hangar besides the hardware I see behind you? Yeah, well, we're fortunate to be surrounded by some cool toys, but uh, Kevin's a good friend of ours and he's a uh, Red Bull family guy. So uh, we based our helicopter here when the season kind of got, uh, well, canceled or went in limbo, this is the closest base that we had. So we came here and it's been great. We've been in Kevin's hangar now for a couple of months. So you're right. I live in Los Angeles and I've been coming out here to visit this pretty girl behind me and do some flying with Kevin and do maintenance and all the stuff we normally do in L.A. We've been doing half of it here in Louisiana and the other half in L.A. Well, I think it's important for folks watching this to understand that you have to obviously remain proficient and current, even if there's not a string of air shows or Red Bull events that you need to fly. As we take a look at some video of the incredible aerobatics that this B0105 helicopter can do, I want you to talk about what makes this particular platform unique for flying the aerobatics that you fly. Well, the B0105 is a really unique machine. It was designed uh, a while back for, for use with the German Army, so they wanted a helicopter that was able to fly high speed. Uh, nap of the earth. So a lot of altitude changes and pitch changes in rapid succession. So it can handle uh, a wide variety of G loads that most helicopters can't. So we've got a titanium rotor head. We've got a rigid rotor system. So it's able to go upside down and pull more G's and go a little bit negative and do some things that conventional helicopters can't do. That's why Red Bull chose it uh, in the beginning. And that's why we use it today. And I'm, I'm lucky to fly such an amazing machine. Your, your team also had to make some additional modifications to it to be able to do some of even the more extreme aerobatics that you do. Yeah, the modifications made to this helicopter were actually quite minor. Uh, the, the, the two main differences on this one is it's stripped down all the way to the metal, so it's much lighter. Uh, and then the battery was moved from the aft battery station to the nose to, to change the forward CG, to, to get the CG more forward in the envelope to make it a little more favorable for for aerobatics, but uh, but any BO-105 can do what we do right out of the box. It's it's an incredible machine. It's a really solid, proven design over many years. 
How do you learn to fly aerobatics in a helicopter? <laughs> I can tell you how I learned. Uh, so Red Bull has has a really good pilot named Reiner Vilke, and uh, he started flying the BO 105 in I think 1974, and started doing aerobatics in 1984. And he was a demonstration pilot for the German Army and uh, also for for MBB, which is the company that now came became folded into Airbus. But he was a demonstration pilot and a test pilot and a German Army pilot. He's the one who kind of developed the routine that you see us doing now. And he came on board with Red Bull a number of years ago. And he's the one who started the whole program in terms of the training. Our boss is another aerobatic helicopter pilot named Blackie Schwartz, who's a great guy. He's the one who hired me. But Reiner is the one who trained all the Red Bull pilots how to do what we do. Okay, I have to ask you, the first time you get in there and you're with Reiner and you actually start flying your own aerobatics, were you giddy? Were you like very quiet and focused? What was your reaction in the moment when you're like, oh my gosh, I get to do this in a Red Bull helicopter? Okay, that big moment came some hours before that. So I, uh, they had asked me if I was interested in doing the job. This was Blackie. Uh, so Blackie asked me if I was interested. I said yes. And then he took me up on a, uh, one of his training flights, which I think that was the test to whether I could handle it or not. It was just a friendly, hey, come along, ride along while I do some aerobatics and let's keep a real close eye on you and see if you turn green. So I passed that test and then they said, great, we're going to schedule your actual aerobatic training with Reiner Reiner Bilkey, and we're going to do that in Arizona on these set dates. So I had never met Reiner in person. I knew who he was. I'd watched all his videos. I'd seen him on TV. You know, he was mythical aerobatic helicopter pilot. And uh, I knew that I was going to train with him, and I was really excited and honored to be chosen for that. And then when we got to Arizona, because of the time change and everything, I didn't see him until the morning that we started training. And when he walked into the hotel lobby was the moment that I had that exact moment you're talking about where I started to sweat and my blood ran cold. And I thought, oh, no, there he is. I have to do this now. I have to go learn how to flip helicopters. Once you get in the helicopter, then you just get back to work. You know, you do what you it's, I'm just more comfortable in a helicopter than I am thinking about what we're going to do or getting ready for a show. Once the engines are running, I'm OK. So once Ryder and I were in the helicopter together, it went really well. Uh, all, all phases of the training went very well, and it was incredible. I learned a lot from him, and I continue to train with him uh, as often as I can. I email back and forth with him all the time. But, but that moment when I saw him in the hotel lobby was when it all became very real for me. I was a little scared, but we got through that part. When, when you first go to take off in a helicopter that is designed specifically to have an altered CG, so it is more nose heavy, is that something he has to talk you through? Did you notice it right away? And you're like, oh, that's, that, that hits a little different. Like, What was that like? It's not a huge change. We're not at the very forward envelope of the CG, uh, so it's it's different, and we ride a little nose low. Our deck angle is slightly lower, but it's well within the envelope, and it's not that wasn't a huge deal because you can feel as you start to lift the helicopter off the ground, it kind of finds its uh, its attitude relative to the rotor. The rotor disc always comes up straight, and then the helicopter is going to hang from the mast in whatever angle that it, it uh, you know it's balanced for. So. That wasn't. It, you can't really feel the difference between our helicopter and a conventional BO 105 when you take off. You don't really notice until you start doing aerobatics. You mentioned that you didn't turn green. Have you had passengers who have ended up getting sick when they if they take a flight with you? I almost said that most of them get sick, but I'd say half of them do. They get a little queasy. We've had a few throw up. Sure. Uh, the truth is, we don't really take that many people for rides. Uh, but the lucky few that get to go, I'd say it's about half and half on them not feeling great. Everybody enjoys it because it's a ton of fun. Uh, it's not like the ride you took uh, where you're pulling a bunch of Gs and all that. It's nothing like that. It's I only pull uh, during the display sequence. I, I do about 2.7 or 8 on the positive side and just under zero on the negative side. So barely like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of a negative G. Uh, and then if, if it's real turbulent or the conditions aren't good, maybe just over three G's on the positive, like 3.1, but really it's mellow. It's not, it's not, uh, not a hardcore ride. Like if you go with, uh, with rain or Bayo or somebody like that, and just get <laughs> head kicked in. <laughs> I took, oh, so here's a good story. I took Toro on a ride, right? The, uh, the F-16 demo pilot, famous That's who I flew pilot. with. What's that? That's who I flew with. Oh, okay. So he flew with me and there's video of his face and he's just laughing and smiling the entire time because he's enjoying himself. And then we landed. He said, my whole display sequence just hurts. Everything I do hurts. And yours is just fun and enjoyable and easy. And I said, yeah, it's a very different experience. So to answer the question, yes, people get sick, but that's not a rough ride at all. I, I can attest that everything that Toro does when he flies hurts. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine how those guys do that. That's it's I, amazing.
it's a true testimony to uh, their their training and their aptitude for the job. And that actually gives me a nice segue into your history as well, because you are former military. Tell me about when you joined and, and where you served. Uh, so I joined in 1991, and uh, I was enlisted. I didn't fly helicopters in the Army. I was a paratrooper. So I was in the 82nd Airborne. I was an artillery guy. Uh, I wasn't Special Forces or anything like that. Nothing worth bragging about. I had a pretty normal job, but uh, I, I was proud to be an artillery guy. I liked it. Uh, the, the, the king of battle, that's artillery. So I always feel good about that. I had a short time in the Army. It was a short, uh, you know, they were still doing those short wartime contracts. So I was only in for two years, two and a half years. Uh, and then when I discharged, I came out to Los Angeles and started flight training immediately. So I benefited from the Army College Fund. I used that for flight training, but I didn't start flying in the Army. Well, I certainly want to say thank you very much for your service, be it short or otherwise. Um, obviously, everyone who you know makes that sort of personal sacrifice to join um, is something that we definitely appreciate. So thank you for your service. I've learned to say I've, thank you, taxpayer, for all the funding they, so we could do all that fun stuff. That is absolutely right. Um, I I want when you're flying. I have a, a rudimentary understanding of how um, the military jets fly in terms of their gates and their margin of safety, and that extends also to fixed wing performers um, and what they're looking for. I don't have a clue how you determine in your routine um, what works from an energy management standpoint or something like that. So how do you determine? Uh, the maneuvers that you fly and what makes one successful or what makes one that you knock off and, and you know keep practicing or something like that. Well, you hit on the key point already, and that's energy management for the entry gates for each maneuver. So in the beginning, uh, if you see the difference between my first season when I was still kind of getting my feet under me and, and now, there's a pretty good evolution of the flow of the show. And the reason for that is because I've expanded the entry gates to all the maneuvers. So now I don't have to have a set airspeed and a set altitude. Now I've got enough practice to where I, I've expanded those gates to where I can enter a loop at almost any airspeed and I can gain or I can uh, climb or descend at my exit point. So I can control much better now uh, the energy flow of the show. And the result is, uh, is that the show is much smaller now. I used to use the entire box all the way a mile in each direction because I was <laughs> flying along trying to get five more knots, but now I've learned how to, uh, you know, uh, flow the show together much better. And it's the, the result is that the show is more close to the center of the aerobatic box and it's better for the crowd and just, it looks a lot nicer. So I've been practicing. I'm getting better. <laughs> You're hired. You're still hired. <laughs> what is, what is your favorite maneuver to fly? And then what is your perception of the crowd's favorite maneuver? People, uh, the crowd perception is that I think they like the backflip the best because it's kind of unnerving because the helicopter is just hovering out of ground effect stationary. And there's that one little pause at the top. I hold it just for a second, just long enough for everyone to go, what's he doing? And then we'll pull it over backwards and do a backflip. And it's and especially for helicopter pilots, the first time I saw that from the ground, I recoiled in horror because it's just such an unnatural thing for the helicopter. And it feels weird. That's the one where you go negative because you rotate so slowly that you're falling as you go. So it, it feels very weird to do the maneuver from on board. Uh, my personal favorite, though, on my side of the fence, my favorite is the bow turn. So that's almost the opposite. You, you, we climb up with a steep pitch angle. And then when you zero out the airspeed, you rotate forward on the pitch axis to the inverted position. And as the helicopter starts to descend, I do a 180 degree pedal turn on the yaw axis. So we're spinning and falling in the inverted position. And then when I regain the alpha, or the, uh, the, the show line heading, then I rotate again on the pitch axis and fly back out on the reciprocal heading of entry. So it's all, it's three moves in one and it looks really cool. I like it. <laughs> outstanding. Besides the BO-105, what's your favorite helicopter? Uh, the AS350, which is also a Eurocopter product. I've done, the, the bulk of my time is in the AS350. In the States, it's known as an A-Star. Everywhere else in the world, they call it a squirrel. Uh, same helicopter. And we, we do most of the film and television work that I do, and a lot of the utility work that I have done uh, was in the A-Star. But then Tell I like the 500 a lot. I like the Huey a lot. I'm that guy. <laughs> I like whatever. And whenever I'm flying, I look over, oh, that's a cool helicopter. I'm going to fly that one, too. <laughs> that's the way to do it, right? Whatever's closest to you is your favorite in the moment. Yeah, that's um, my favorite right now. It's one of my favorite. <laughs> what? Tell me about living in Los Angeles and doing the work that you do. It's it's so funny to to think about the, 
I, I only know you as a, as a Red Bull pilot and a helicopter air show guy. And you have this entire other life that involves the TV and, and film industry. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's kind of my foundational skill. That's how I make my living is uh, in film and television work. So I have a little aerial production company called Airborne Images. Uh, and I've been working as a film and television pilot for a number of years now, over, over 20, I think. Uh, but it recently, in the last four or five years, I've gotten at the, the level where I get to go work on big features all over the world, and it's been great. So, uh, yeah, that's that's my main job. But people, uh, we work behind the scenes, so you wouldn't necessarily know me from that. You see the work, obviously, but you don't know who flew on the show or in work in what capacity. Uh, but my my awesome part time job that I have is more high profile. Okay, what's what is something that maybe people have seen that you actually and Airborne Images was a part of? Uh, well, very recently, I, I worked on a show called Extraction, which is a huge movie. It was number one movie in the world when it came out a couple months ago, uh, and that was with Chris Hemsworth, you know, the big famous movie star. It was oh, fun. Of course, work. I know Chris Hemsworth. Come on now. I don't think I've met a woman who doesn't know who Chris Hemsworth is. <laughs> I'm happy to report that he's a super cool guy, and he's every bit as handsome and striking in person as he is on screen. Uh, and it was a fun one to work on. Because we got to do, I'll, I'll tell you the story. Actually, two people told me to stop telling the story because it doesn't paint me in a good light. But we were working on a bridge. In the movie. If you've seen the movie Extraction, the final scene is a big gun battle on this bridge, right? So we shot that in Thailand. And my job, I was, I was the, uh, the aerial camera. I was hovering next to the bridge. So I was flying along sideways as the gun battle made its way from one end of the bridge to the other. So I was, I was 15 feet maybe from the cars that were blowing up and their pyro going off and all that. So on the, uh, the final run through, they had Chris there. Normally the stunt guys do that, but Chris does a lot of his own stunts. He's, he's a pretty capable guy. He's a big athlete, big strong guy. Anyway, they had him with his automatic weapon. He's going down the bridge and there's smoke everywhere and pyro's going off and I'm holding my position and everything. Then we're, all the chatter in the radio, what's happening. And everything just kind of slows down for a couple seconds and I'm looking through the swirling smoke and I see him and I'm thinking, no wonder that guy's a movie star. That's a very attractive human being. He doesn't look like the rest <laughs> of us. And then after, then everything just kind of sped back up into real time, and then I was working again. That's kind of funny. <laughs> that paints you in a fantastic light. Because, by the way, I'd be having the exact same reaction if I was in that moment. So, <laughs> as yeah, you... my wife told me not to talk to her when he's on screen. <laughs> Watching Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> what is some of the most fun flying for... Um, for Hollywood and TV and film projects that you, we know what the air show line looks like, but what are some of the other cool places that you've gotten to, to go to or some really interesting flying that you've gotten to do as a result of this? Well, that was a big one. Uh, working in yeah. Thailand was cool. Uh, had really nice equipment. We had three helicopters on that show and lots of pyro and everything. And then we just finished another one for the same production company. I can't tell you too much about it, but I can tell you that we had, uh, we had seven Blackhawks and two F-15s and tanks and trucks and shot another big battle scene. So I'm excited to see that one come out. Uh, but I've been really fortunate. I've gotten to work on some really fun uh, projects and, and fun features. And then I've worked on a bunch of really cool TV shows that aren't necessarily super high profile, but they're they're loved and, and they've, they've, they're still on the air and it's good fun to go work on it. One example of that would be, it was a discovery show called Dirty Jobs and the host was oh. guy, Mike Rowe. Remember that He's show? He's awesome. Absolutely. It's coming back, by the way. It's coming back, so there'll be more of those coming up. But we shot all the aerials for that, so I got to travel around the, uh, the country with that crew shooting all the aerials for that show. And he's another example of a guy who's really cool in person and just really nice and exactly who you see on screen. That's who Mike Rowe is in person. So it was a real privilege to work on that show with him and, and go around the country with Barsky and the crew and all that. It was cool. And I've been fortunate. I've had a, a lot of experiences like that. Years. You you are exactly the epitome of that guy. You on screen are the same guy when you're off screen. Always kind, always a nice compliment, nice word for someone. But I do want your autograph. I did not realize that you were like so celebrity adjacent. I think that is fantastic. Celebrity adjacent. I've met so many celebrities that you should probably get my autograph too. Is that <laughs> Consider it done. <laughs> hey, Kevin Coleman's here. I can get his autograph for you. Yeah, just have him come sneaking behind your shot, like while we're doing this, just give a wave. <laughs> um, what are some of the other planes that you like to fly? Because I've seen, you know, I follow you on Instagram, and we'll put your Instagram handle up on the screen so people can check out what you do. You do a fair bit of fun GA flying as well, which is very relatable to people who are going to watch this video. 
Yeah, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I have a decathlon. It's it's an old one. It's a straight D. It's the 150 horse with fixed pitch propeller, and uh, I fly it. I won't. I almost said every day. I don't fly it every day, but pretty close to every day. I love that little plane. I'll work all day in the helicopter and then put the helicopter away, and then around the corner in, in my in the other little hangar is my little plane, and I look at my watch and go, I got an hour of daylight. I'm going to jump in that thing and go fly. So I do it all the time, uh, and I love it. I love aerobatics in it. It's similar to the helicopter in terms of the energy and the speeds and everything like that. It feels about the same, so it's a good way for me to keep my aerobatic kind of proficiency and G tolerance up. Low G It's not – Everybody watching is laughing when they say G tolerance. Uh, but also with that plane, which I love the most about it, is I'm teaching both my sons to fly it. So I have a 14 and a 15 year old uh, at home, and they're both learning how to fly. The 15 year old is actually working on his aerobatic sequence right now. So hopefully on his 16th birthday, he'll be ready to do the uh, sportsman's routine. That's what we're working toward. That's his goal. Man. That is just the coolest. I love, I do love hearing when aviation sort of permeates its way through the family. What was your path to aviation? Did, did what, Was it in your family? How did you kind of find your way into flying? There was, okay, so the only aviator in my family that we know of uh, is a guy named Lauren G, who's technically, I think, my second cousin. He's my mom's first cousin, so I hardly knew him. Uh, he's, he's a bit older than me, uh, and he was a Cobra pilot in Vietnam, so I heard all these legendary stories about him. Uh, so that... That was something that I could relate to, but it wasn't it wasn't a family tradition. He didn't fly anymore when he got out of the army, so I I kind of had to find my own way. I, I went and took a class at my high school. I'm from a little town called Wenatchee, Washington. Right. Hey, I live in Washington. Oh, sure. Sensible person. Uh, I, yeah, I, I come from Wenatchee, and there, there's there's a little airport there, and it's a U.S. Forest Service tanker base. So there's a lot of firefighting activity going on, and at that time when I was growing up, the logging industry was going real strong in that area. So I saw and heard helicopters almost every day of my life, but I kind of had to find my way out, my, my own way in and make my own connections and kind of start from scratch. I didn't come from an aviation family. So it's very different from my sons. They Obviously, they're getting a bigger head start than I got, and they're going to they're gonna have a hopefully a, a rewarding career. I don't know if they want to both be professional pilots. The older one does, I think, uh, but I don't know about the other. Well, even if whatever their touch point is for aviation, it's still going to be amazing and open up opportunities to them as a result of it. What, tell me about your first solo. Uh, the first solo isn't that interesting of a story, but the first time I actually flew in an airplane, that's actually, that's pretty funny. So the, I took a class at my high school called Aerodynamics and Weather. It was a science credit. And I know now that that was it was the private pilot syllabus, but they stretched it out over a semester and the teacher was a pilot. So he just taught that as a science credit. So part of that was that you get a plane ride at some point in the semester. So when my turn came up, I won the coin toss and I got to sit in the front. I was 15 years old and uh, I got to fly a little bit and I was horrible at it. And I was so <laughs> excited to fly that I actually made myself airsick and I threw up on my oh. first flight. Never again, but on that first flight, I actually uh, filled the bag, which makes me more empathetic when people get sick. I don't, you know, I don't make fun of anyone for it. I know how it feels. It's terrible. So I try to be easy on people and I, I try not to make people get sick, but I know how it feels. So that was my start. Not super glamorous. <laughs> I know we talked about your favorite helicopters. What is your favorite, if you had to pick, what's your favorite airplane besides the decathlon? Well, that's a good question because I haven't really flown that many airplanes. I, I'm not a guy with a ton of experience in that side of the fence. You know, I've gotten to go for some rides and everything. I, I got—I was lucky enough. I got to go for a ride in the P-51. That was incredible. I flew with a Reno Air Race pilot, and uh, it was—it was, it was eye-opening. Uh, really, really fun. So I don't know. Maybe a P-51. I've always loved the Corsair. I'm a Pacific guy, so I, I like the Corsair a lot. Uh, Red Bull has a really beautiful one. But I've never ridden in one of those. I, honestly, I don't know what my favorite airplane is. I love the bird dog. I love Stearman's. I fly tail dragger, so I'm kind of a tail dragger guy. <laughs> you have like you still have so many amazing experiences when it comes to aviation. But I want to know a little bit about what you do outside of aviation. And I know because I, I follow you on Instagram, one of the things you love to do is spend time on the water. Tell me a little yeah. bit about that. And what else do you like to do? Well, I'm fortunate in L.A. I live at the beach. I live in Ventura County, and I, uh, our beach is kind of a spit of land. So out the front, you have the ocean. You can go out and surf or whatever you want to do, swim in the ocean, hang out on the beach. But if you go out the back door and go a half a block, there's a giant marina, and that's where I keep my fishing boat. So 
I, uh, I spend a lot more time out on the water than I do on the beach. So uh, my boys and I like to go out and fish as often as possible. And sometimes we just run around out there and chase dolphins and look for whales or whatever. But uh, I'm, I'm big into fishing. I grew up fishing. My dad is a commercial fisherman. So when I'm not flying, I try to be on the water. I know that um, you have a lot of things that you do, and I don't know how you manage to find the time to be an air show pilot with Red Bull um, and do all of the Red Bull activities that come along with that beyond air shows. You also do, you know, the, the work that you do in Hollywood. And then what is this about the distillery? Tell me about this. <laughs> so I'm a hockey player. I've been playing hockey my whole life. And uh, one of the guys that I play hockey with, a very good friend of mine, he was a bar manager and he was always distilling in his garage and working on recipes because his grandfather was a distiller. And his grandfather was a guy named Nat Kidder with one of the craziest life stories you'll ever hear. But he was a, uh, an electrical engineer that worked in Pearl Harbor uh, in the years before the war. He actually left Pearl Harbor three days before the attack with his pregnant wife. But one of the things he did in Pearl Harbor, because no one could afford, none of the enlisted Navy guys could afford booze at that time, you know, it was the Depression. They were drinking the torpedo propellant. They were trying to make their own booze. They were doing. They were making themselves sick and injuring themselves. So he started distilling just as a favor to all the other enlisted guys. And then he continued to distill for the rest of his life. And he was famously mediocre at it. He never did it as a as a hobby or as a as a business. It was always just a hobby. And uh, and so David, my partner, picked up where where Nat Kidder left off, and we started the company. Uh, and, and we do it together. He does most of the work. Uh, like you said, I'm kind of on the road all the time, so I'm not around to help out in the distillery, but, but we're partners and he, and, and everything is kind of an homage to the, to the grandpa. And we named the, the vodka that we make after him. It's called Nat Hitter Navy Strength Vodka. And then we make a whiskey called, uh, Old Cal or Old, Old 49 California Whiskey. They're both really good. We're proud of them. We're a small company though. It's not, I'm, I'm not ready to retire quite yet. But if it gets big, I promise right now that I will have an air show act sponsored by the distillery. But I have to get big first. Need a little more money for that. These things are expensive. <laughs> they are expensive. I'm updating my LinkedIn profile right now to say famously mediocre. That is <laughs> one, of the best, one of the best taglines ever. Um, what does EAA Air Venture mean to you? It means the, the biggest show, the biggest group, the most enthusiastic uh, group of people about aviation that I've ever seen. I've heard about Oshkosh my whole life, my whole flying career, but I never got to go until 2018. So, uh, you know, helicopter pilots, we're, we're always too busy working. So we, we don't, I've never got the chance to go to Oshkosh. So finally, 2018 was my first year that I ever saw it. And it was mind blowing. And, and so I kind of, saw everything all at once and learned all about the show from the other side of the fence. Of course, there's no fence at Oshkosh, so it's it's just a cool place. I, I was very excited to be there. And then I was there again last year. I didn't put you and your viewers what you've known for years, but I discovered it myself in 2018, and I'm, I'm a huge fan. I'm proud to be part of it in a small way. Okay, I know you're in Kevin Coleman's hangar, and I know that Kevin Coleman has a lot of cool things in his hangar. Will you give us a quick tour and show me what's going on in there? Absolutely. Okay, bear with me. I'll try to make the best camera work I can here. But first, we isn't have this your job? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm not going to make any promises, but I'll do the best I can. Okay. So this is Kevin's two seat extra. This is my understanding is that this is his first extra, and he's been flying this since he was 17, I think. He, I got to go for a ride in it, and it was mind blowing. It's uh, unbelievable what this thing will do. So uh, yeah, airplane number one. That's in the back corner, and then we have. This beautiful helicopter. We're just guests here, so we get to take up the center spot. We're in the position of honor. And here's something super unusual. You guys have seen this before because Kevin does air shows in it, and Jim Pites does too. But this is an aerobatic bonanza. So you can put the family in it and your dog and everything else and fly to an air show and then turn on the smoke and go do a killer performance. And it's really nice. It's really beautiful because it's like more flowy and slow. And then this is the fire breathing dragon, the single seat extra. I don't know how he even lands this thing. I've seen him do it, and I've seen the race guys do it. Now Kevin Coleman's a—he was a, a Red Bull Air Race pilot, so extraordinarily high level of skill to fly one of these things. It look, looks like it's going 200 knots just sitting there, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I, and then we're right I, in the center. I think the one thing I could probably handle is the golf cart that's behind it, and that's about it. Everything else looks incredibly impressive. Yeah, that's not super fast. I've been on the golf cart. I think he actually needs to upgrade that so it's more in keeping with the Coleman tradition of full speed. Uh, 
standing. Aaron Fitzgerald, I cannot thank you enough for your time. I know you have a busy day of flying with Kevin Coleman, um, but you, you carved out some time for us today, and we appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. For everyone watching EAA Spirit of Aviation Week content, there is so much more. Be sure to check out the website. Continue to look for the content out there. We have got on-demand coverage. We have videos. All of it there for you. Enjoy.